So Nomiko has some amazing things in store for you. He comes from, well, for currently, he comes from Canada, from Alberta, um, where he is the children's ministries director there, amongst many other things. And he, it has just been a real blessing to have him here, hasn't it? Yeah, I can see the room is full. It's ready for you. Let's have a word of prayer before we start. Dear Lord, I just ask that your presence would be with us this afternoon, be with Nomiko as he shares um, of the passions of his heart and the things that you have placed there. Um, may we learn the things that you would have us to learn, open our minds and our hearts to your word through Nomiko. Amen. It's kind of a good thing that black people can't blush because, <laughs> Linda, your check is in the mail. Um, <laughs> Really excited to see everyone here this afternoon, and uh, really excited to share this seminar because this comes straight from my heart. This is not textbook knowledge. This is straight from God, fresh baked from glory to you. And so I hope you're blessed this afternoon as we uh, dive into our topic from mundane to magnificent. I'm going to say one more prayer, and then we're going to get started. Is that all right? Let's do it. What was that? Stay close to the table. All right. Stay in the light. Is that what you want? Okay, yes. Well, not leave the light. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we are extremely excited to be here this afternoon and just talk, to talk about spiritual things. And as we dive in, Lord, I ask that you'll make sure that we have enough time, that we get through all of the material, and that something speaks to every single heart here, dear God, because where two or three are gathered, there you are in the midst. And that means transformation, Father. So we're asking in a special way that you'll speak to every single person. You know the needs in this room, dear God. And I just ask that you provide those needs so that they can go back to their churches and deliver what you want them to deliver. That is my prayer. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So I'm really excited to be here with you talking about how to do illustrations and sharing illustrations that will create a powerful experience in your children's ministries uh, ministry back home. So... Uh, I'd like to start off with a little bit of an illustration, and there's a story told of this young boy who is in Israel, modern-day Israel, and he was sitting on a bench, and he was crying, and as he was sitting on that bench crying, his sobs could be, you know, heard for a few meters away and, and actually a few, few blocks away, and so what happened was that there was a rabbi who was nearby, and he was walking, and the rabbi heard the little boy wailing and sobbing, and he said, maybe I should just go sit down and see what's wrong. And so as he was on his way home, he kind of walked over and sat down beside the boy on the bench. And he says, my son, what's wrong? And the little boy's name was the Hebrew equivalent of Jacob, which is Yaakov. And he says, my son, what is wrong? And he says, oh, I'm, I'm so sorry, Rebbe, because they're so respected. I didn't mean to cry in front of you. But something very sad has happened. And he's like, I can see that. What has happened to you? And he proceeds to tell him, well, it goes like this. I was having a really fun time playing hide and go seek with my friends. And we were all having real lots of fun. And then all my friends went and hid. And then I hid so well that all my friends left me and went home. <laughs> And he proceeds to cry, and he proceeds to cry. And then the rabbi says, <laughs> he starts to giggle and laugh. And then as he's laughing, the boy proceeds to continue crying. And then all of a sudden, something clicks in the rabbi's mind. And then all of a sudden, a tear wells up in the rabbi's eye. And the rabbi slowly begins to start crying. And he starts to wail and to sob. And then little Yaakov looks up and he goes, yes, it's sad, didn't I tell you? <laughs> and they're both crying. And they both have this wailing, sobbing moment until Yaakov looks at him and he's like, why are you still crying? Hold on, it's not that sad. Why are you crying? And he says, well, it is because this is what has happened to Hashem, to God. God has hidden himself in the world and men have stopped looking for him. And what I want to share with you, friends, today is that God has hidden himself in the world, but we just need to look for him. Amen? Everything is spiritual. And by everything, I mean literally everything. The God that put this world together, put the atoms together, he was intentional about everything he did. So everything in nature that you see that you can touch speaks about the God that created it. Amen? 
Most people don't realize, but just the fact that God created in seven days when he could have created in one second means he's trying to communicate something to humanity. Amen? So everything is spiritual, but God is just waiting to be found in nature and all around us. And Jesus lived this. He didn't just understand this. He lived this. Reading from um, the pen of inspiration, she says here, Jesus taught by illustrations and parables drawn from nature and the familiar events of everyday life. In this way, he associated natural things with spiritual, linking the things of nature and the life experience of his hearers with the sublime truths of the written word. And whenever afterward their eyes rested upon the objects with which he had associated eternal truth, his lessons were repeated. And so Jesus was literally looking around at all the, 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 the things that were around him and using those as illustrations to teach the lessons. He wasn't contriving situations. And I'm about to show you some things that are mind-blowing, absolutely mind-blowing. I have to get through this text a little bit here first. So we remember a situation where it says here, The sun has set behind the mountains, and the heavens are curtained with the shades of evening. In full view is a dwelling house lit, lighted up brilliantly as if for some festive scene. The light streams from the openings, and an expectant company wait around, indicating that a marriage procession is soon about to appear. In many parts of the East, wedding festivities are held in the evening. The bridegroom goes forth to meet his bride and to bring her to his home. By torchlight, the bridal party proceed from her father's house to his own, where a feast is provided for the invited guests. In the scene upon which Christ looks, a company are awaiting the appearance of the bridal party, intending to join the procession. What parable does he tell right after this? The parable of the ten virgins. Amen? So what he's doing is he's not just coming up with these things that he's thought up before. He's literally just sitting there in the moment. Jesus was supernatural, but he was also natural. Amen? So he was sitting there, and he's just like, this strikes my mind. And then he used that illustration in the situation. And this is what I want to, commu to con communicate to you today because that will be possible to you. Um, you know, one of the things that happened was... When Jesus was teaching, Ellen White says in another place, she says that somebody would literally stop him speaking. They'd say, hey, 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 Rabbi, what do you mean? I don't understand what you mean about the kingdom of heaven. And he'd be like, the kingdom of heaven, it's like a mustard seed. And that's what would be right there beside him. Does that make sense? And so that's what he would be using to illustrate his points. He would use things that were right around him. Sometimes it wasn't a thing that was right around him. Sometimes it would only be a nearby question. And this is really cool because rabbis of Jesus' day, they would use questions also to make a point made. And so they would answer your question with a question. And I heard a story about a one lady who was saying, oh, yeah, Jesus is the answer man. And then somebody argued with him, no, Jesus is the question man because he was a rabbi. No, Jesus is the answer man. And this debate went back and forth until she went to Israel and she went into one of these small shops of a Holocaust survivor who was a rabbi. And she wasn't really interested in his stuff. And she looked around and she says, so uh, which one of these is your favorite? And then the man looks at her and he steps back. And he says, are you married? And, he, and she says, no, no. Which one of these is your favorite? Maybe the hearing aid is not working. And he says, are you married? And she's like, yes, Why? And she answered with a question so he can continue. And he's like, do you have any children? And she's like, three, yes, why? And he's like, which one of them is your favorite? Ding. And this is what rabbis of that, their age would do. They would teach and make points by asking questions. And the reason why this works so well is because the answer that mattered is not my, my answer that I give to you, but the answer that comes from your own heart. Does that make sense? So this is what they did. Um, that's happened to me multiple times. You know, right now it's the, uh, the uh, construction theme that we're doing. And I remember one time I had, I had a little rabbi moment myself. I was walking home, and on my way home, I saw these two construction guys, and they were super-duper tired. And they're like, hey, man, you want to make 20 bucks? And I was like, why? Yeah, what, 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 do you, what do I have to do? And they're like, help us carry up these two-by-fours up these stairs. And I was like, uh, how many flights? There's like three floors. And I was like, okay, fine. So then I put the two by four, and I was like, oh, my goodness. <laughs> it was super duper heavy, right? And so as we're going up and down the stairs with these two by fours helping them, it was really, really heavy. And the thought came to my mind. I was like, man, this must have been what Jesus felt. So I said it to one of the guys. They're not religious. I was like, man, now I know how Jesus felt. And he's like, bah! And he drops the thing. And he's like, it's so true. 
It's so, this is how Jesus must have. And I see him run down and like drop the thing and run down outside. And he's like pointing at me from the outside of the building. He's like, he talked about Jesus and it makes so much sense. Wow. He carried that burden. You know what I mean? So that was kind of my mini rabbi moment. But I just realized that those moments happen to us all day long where we can use something that's happening to illustrate a spiritual point. Does that make sense? So everything is spiritual. And our own doctrines are spiritual too. So I'll give you an example of that right? One time a kid asked me, hey, why doesn't God destroy the devil? Have you ever wondered that question? Okay, so this, this illustration is actually taken from a preacher by the name of Ivor Myers, right? And one of the things that he was saying was that if you imagine sin like putting trash in the garbage, right? Um, you continue to put sin in the garbage. Every time you sin and you, you make a mistake, you throw something in the garbage, and it's like you're asking for forgiveness, Right? You're throwing your sin in the garbage. At the end of the week, what happens to all that trash? It goes to the dump. And then what do you have to do? You, you have to take that trash and you have to go what? Put it out, right? So here's the thing. In the sanctuary system, the Bible says that in Leviticus 16, 22, and the goat shall bear upon him all their iniquities unto a land not inhabited, and he shall let go the goat in the wilderness, right? So all the sins go on who? On the scapegoat, right? So literally, Satan is kept back as your trash can. Do you throw out your trash can? No, you keep it because that's where you put your garbage. Exactly. That's why Satan is still alive. Because at the end of time, he will be the one that will be bearing your sin to the land uninhabited. Amen? So this is how it works. So these little illustrations, I mean, that's just a really small and quick one. So how did I start seeing it? Um, one of the promises that I like to claim, Jeremiah 33, verse 3, it says, Call unto me, and I will answer thee and show thee great and mighty things which thou knowest not. And as you pray that prayer, I believe God will show you amazing ways to illustrate his truth. So the first way that I started looking for uh, deeper things, I'm kind of a Bible nerd. Is that all right? Do you guys like studying the Bible? But I think it's going to be really interesting as we go forward, so bear with me. I was asking God about the number 10. How many of you guys know uh, what the number seven symbolizes? Perfection or completion. Have you heard that before? Now, wouldn't it be really random and arbitrary if the number seven meant something and then all the other numbers didn't mean anything? Wouldn't that be kind of random? It was like, do you name all of your children or do you just name like one of them? Does that make sense? So the number seven clearly means that. So I said, God, what does the number 10 symbolize, right? And I was reading it through the Psalms. Uh, it talks about David playing on an instrument of 10 strings in multiple places. So I was like, what is the symbolism of that, right? Why 10? And then God said to me, start asking the right questions. So I'm asking you guys, how many people were the test if God should destroy Sodom? He started at what? 50, and then he worked his way down to? To 10. Okay. How many degrees were the test if God should fulfill his promise to Hezekiah? How many degrees did he want the, the, the um, sundial? 10 degrees, right? Was it sundial? Okay. How many days were Daniel and his friends tested for? And when tested, how many times better were they? Ah, okay. How much money does God ask us to test him with? Ah, 10%. Okay, the tithe. And how many wise virgins are there? No, it's five wise virgins. Got you there. How many foolish virgins are there? And how many were tested? Ah, interesting. Okay. And how many days was the church of Smyrna tested in Revelation? Ten days. You shall have tribulation ten days is what it says, right? So, and how many commandments test whether we love God? Ten. Okay, now on a scale of one, two. How's my evidence? <laughs> right, so here's the cool thing. You, most people don't get that, but what I'm trying to prove is that the thing that we measure most things by is on the scale of 10, the decimal system, right? When somebody's going off of a diving board, we don't say, okay, on a scale of 1 to 19, how good was that, that dive? Or 1 to 14, right? It's usually tested on a scale of 1 to 10. Now, that's symbolic in the scriptures, but it comes out into reality. So the author of the word is also the author of the world, and they should be coherent together. Does that make sense? So this is when you start, you know, studying and just praying and saying, God, reveal to me some of this amazing stuff that I can bring it out for kids. And it just shows you how consistent the Bible is and coherent it is with reality. So 
another way is of saying it is that 10 means it's been tested. So when David says, play on an instrument of 10 strings, he's saying your song, your song should be a testimony. Amen? Evidence that you've proven God and you know that he's good. So that's just one illustration. But speaking of music, here's another illustration. So we're going to use the sound right now, guys. This comes from a friend of mine back in Montreal, which is pretty cool. Um, and he says here, in the beginning, God created the heavens, which is this chord, the G major chord, right? And then, after he created the heavens, he created the earth. F major chord, right? Now, the trouble with uh, heaven and earth was that they were separate chords. There was the F major and then the G major, but nothing brought them together. So God needed to bring them together. And what did he send? He sent E for Emmanuel. Or me, if you're do, re, me, for Michael. And so when you have me in the picture, you have heaven and earth being joined by Jesus Christ. <laughs> so this is a simple illustration just from the notes on a piano, right? I had a pianist friend that showed me that one, so I, I hope, uh, hope that's a blessing. So now we're going to move to the tangible illustrations, and this is where I'm going to need some help. So do we have any um, volunteers that uh, would be willing to come up? Okay, we got a volunteer, number one. Why don't you come up front here, my friend? And we're going to try some things that might get a little bit scary. <laughs> <laughs> that was the intention. Okay. So these tangible illustrations, I got to tell you, um, I just did a week of prayer for the adventurers, and I would always finish with these illustrations, and man, it went so powerfully. We had like, it's like 300 kids there, and like 70 of them came up for baptism at the end. Um, just, just the reaction was, I was telling one of the other youth uh, recently, like a month later, a lady was like, what happened to my son? Every day he read Bible. He read Bible every day. A month after. He's no, he don't eat meat anymore. Vegetarian. Every single day. Eat, read Bible. Eat vegetarian. It's crazy to me. I need to meet this guy. Romanian, you know. <laughs> and so she was literally going on about how, how well things went for her son. So the lasting effects, you may not know how far the lasting effects will be. So our first illustration um, is going to be what I like to call uh, remaining filled. So in the Bible, when the Holy Spirit fell upon Samson, he could be not hurt by the Philistines. Can you hold that? Okay. So when we're filled with the Holy Spirit, I also believe that we will remain unhurt. Um, do you have a problem with your sweater getting wet? You sure? <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 don't worry, don't worry, don't worry. <laughs> um, so, so the idea is that say we are the bag and the water is the Holy Spirit. Once we are filled, it's not going to hurt us whenever the devil throws his darts at us. Do you believe that? Kind of like Samson, when the Philistines came upon him, the Spirit of God was upon him and nothing they could do could stop him. Do you believe that we can reproduce that effect here today? Okay, let's try it out. All right, you ready? You like that sweater? <laughs> Don't worry. So the trick is... Oh, no. Okay, yeah, I messed it up. <laughs> the first one, it's okay. It's okay. So, so hold on a second. Make sure the water is empty. Okay, so... So hold on a second. I brought a backup for that. I brought a backup for that. Hold on a second. Um, always be prepared for the unexpected. So I have another bag. And let us fill this one with water. And I'll just show you that it works. Because basically what you need to do, what you need to do, You need to make sure, so that's the how not to do it. That was my intention. <laughs> right. We'll start off with that, okay? Um, you need to 
make sure that you have round pencils, okay? And once you have round pencils and they have a pointed tip, you got to make sure you either go all the way through or halfway, okay? So let's try that one more time. It's never happened to me before, so. All right, so let's point it this way. So if it bursts, I get it this time. All right. What's that? Okay, I'll put it down. Yeah, good idea. Okay. All right, so can you do this a little bit? I'll see. Yeah. All right, do you see that? All right, one more. Let's do one more. And you can do multiple of them. Next one is the power of proximity. I'm giving you guys like all my good stuff, so I hope you really appreciate it, all right? <laughs> These are some like gold <laughs> illustrations. Um, I, I'll give you a resource for some of these, yeah. Um, so this one's gonna be really hard to see because of the light. Can we dim some of these lights, guys? Can any of the lights be dim? No? So. So, basically, whoops. so uh, when Moses was on the mountain with God, uh, what happened to his face? It shone, right? There's power when we spend time in the presence of God. Do you believe that? There is. There is. Things change for us. And um, one of the most striking illustrations of that in the scriptures is when Gabriel shows up to Daniel, he shows up and he doesn't say, I am the highest angel in heaven. What does he say? He says, I am Gabriel that stand in the presence of the Lord. And Gabriel's authority is determined by where he spends his time. Oh, let me say that again. Gabriel's authority is determined by where he spends his time. So if you spend time with God, then your spiritual authority rises. Amen? So this is what I wanted to teach the kids when I brought that out. And so you could imagine that this is kind of the, the Shekinah glory, which is interesting, it looks kind of like that. And you can, get a bigger, um, you can get a bigger globe than this, so the illustration is really, really clear. But what happens is, right now, this halogen bulb is not lit, right? But as I get closer with it, watch what happens. So basically, when you bring it near and it spends, it's, it's in proximity to it, it actually stays lit up itself, right? And when you stay close to God, you're going to stay lit up in your spiritual life. Amen? So this one is a great one for kids. You just need this uh, plasma ball and a halogen light that you can see. Determined by where he spends his time. Yeah. Uh, another one that I like. Okay, this one's pretty cool. Um, here is the situation where the three wor Hebrew worthies, they show up and they decide they're not going to bow down to Babylon, right? So sometimes in our spiritual lives, we feel like God is not present, like he's not there. Have you ever felt like that? Well, this is a reality for a lot of people. But one of the things that happens that I realize is that God typically doesn't always show up when things are good or in the, in, in the mundane moments. He shows up when we need it. Amen? So what I've learned is if you imagine that you are this glass here and Jesus is the light bulb, you sometimes wonder, like, God, how come you're not lighting up my spiritual life? How come you're not performing miracles? How come the big prayer answers that I'm looking for, I'm not seeing, right? And sometimes we all, want, we all wonder and struggle with that, right? So just like that, 
when you put this in here, <laughs> somebody's like really scared. <laughs> And you're wondering, you're like, Lord, you know, where are you? I don't see you in my spiritual life. One of the things that happens is that God allows temptations, allows trials to come to us. Why does he allow those temptations and trials to come to us? To teach us, right? Why didn't God or or Jesus, the the, the son of man that showed up in Daniel chapter 3, why didn't he show up beforehand and say, Nebuchadnezzar, don't put them in the fire? Why didn't he do that? Say that again. Because he wanted to show himself strong. Yes. He wanted to show his power in the midst of a difficult situation. And sometimes God sends us trials in order to show up inside of that trial to show you that he's a God that cares about your your deliverance. Amen? So what I'm going to show you right now is uh, a a pretty risky one because this is metal and this is going in there. But do you guys believe that we can get the light bulb to light up? in the midst of a hot situation. Do you believe it? Can everybody see? Okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You want to back up? <laughs> yeah. Okay, I, I don't know how well you'll be able to see in there, but I'm going to hit it, and uh, you guys may need to get under the tables if necessary, all right? So just be ready, all right? Three, two, <laughs> let's get a countdown. Five, four, three, two. One. Can you see? There you go. God shows up in the difficult situations. Amen? (laughs) It can stay lit for about five to ten seconds, but I just don't want to say freak anybody out and radiation waves. Yeah, I don't have any kids yet, so let's not do that. What? Pardon me? Exactly, or explosions. So, so this is a really awesome one. Like when we did this at the um, for the kids, literally when they saw, it, they didn't believe it was gonna light up. They're like, "Whatever, man!" And then when they said, "They're like, whoa, dude, the light bulb lit up. That's crazy!" And so they they love that one. Um, really, really fun one that you can use. Um, what is another one here that we have? What's next? The next one. Can you hit the next slide for me, friend? Oh, it's not showing up here. Okay. Oh, here we go. This one is walking on water. Okay. Can you do it for me? Yeah. It's it's, it's not going. Oh, there we go. Perfect. All right. So this next one is walking on water. Um, so this one is really fun because all you need is a bowl of water and two paper clips, right? So how many of you guys remember the scene when Peter walked on the water with Jesus? What was that? <laughs> right. Um, now, if you think about it, right, if Peter decided to try that himself, what would have happened? He would have sunk, right? That's the natural thing. Without some special help, there's no way that we'll stay on top of water like Jesus did, right? So that'll be the example. We'll leave that one there. But the idea is that the power of faith can allow us to accomplish things that are basically impossible. So when God is in the picture, we can be in a rough situation, kind of like living in the world but not being of the world. Does that make sense? How do you actually do that, right? Well, it starts by letting... It starts by you allowing Jesus to lay a foundation. And this is just a um, paper towel from a bathroom. So what you do is you lay the paper towel down. And it usually it stays right on the surface. Okay, wait, 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 wait. So this is a tricky one. I, need, I may need a hand to, to hold the microphone while I do it. If I can get... Just another volunteer. Thank you, Linda. So the trick is you have to get a a piece of the paper towel that's small enough to float in the center of the bowl, okay? So right now the paper towel is, you can't really see it, but it's there floating. And then once that's there, now Jesus invited Peter to walk out onto the water, right, after he set it up. 
And so Jesus is kind of like that paper towel that's floating there. And then you put the thing there, and then notice it's now floating, right? It's holding it up. But could Jesus actually sustain us without being there? Could Jesus actually sustain Peter without holding his hand? Do you think he could? Let's try and see. So what you do is you slowly tap, tap it, and it will stay floating. Oh, did you see it? You know, obviously you can't see it, but it stayed floating for a few seconds. But it does, it, it'll actually stay flo floating indefinitely. Let me do it one more time. This is so funny. These, nev these always work perfectly. <laughs> Back in your house, you're like, oh, these are going to be great. <laughs> and then you get in front of people, and it's like, yeah, it's funny. No, but here, let's try it again. Well, that's all right. That's okay. Remember when Jesus healed that, that man who was blind, and it didn't look like he was doing it right? Yeah. And he's like, I see men as trees, and then he had to touch him again? Sometimes that situation happens in real life. So <laughs> let's, <laughs> or in, in present day, rather. So let's do it. Uh, ah, I got to be soft to the touch. One more time, one more time. One more time, one more time. So a bigger bowl helps. When you're doing this one, obviously. Um, but you lay the paper down. Oh, yeah. And, okay, yeah, here's the other trick. Um, the thicker the paper towel, the better. Better. So if you use thick paper towels, that'll help it stay up a little bit um, more, a little bit longer. So let's try that one more time. There you go. And then... There you go. See it? It's floating. So it stays walking on water. Amen. All right. Thank you. <laughs> cool. So that is that one. Uh, the next one is the faith of friends. I need four volunteers. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry. <laughs> four friends. I need four people to come up here. And one really, really risky, risk-taking individual. Okay. Grab one of these. I need you four to take a balloon. Yeah, we need another one. There you go. Thank you. All right. Now, and I need one uh, risk-taking individual, somebody who's pretty crazy. <laughs> Come on. Yeah, you want to do? You want to be the guy? Okay, you can be the guy. <laughs> yeah. We need. We need, but we need one more person anyway. Because in Jesus' parable of the paralytic, you have the four friends, and you have who? The paralytic, right? So what we're going to do is we're going to basically illustrate what happened because those guys realized that he couldn't make his way to Jesus. So what did they have to do? They had to carry him, right? So you guys blowing into those balloons will be like your prayers. Now you have to blow into that, those balloons like you're praying for somebody, right? And it's going to help Sherry over here, okay? Oh, no. Oh, you're going to do it. Okay, fine. It's, it's going to help her. And, and we'll show you what the trial is in a second. But I need you to blow up the balloons all to the same size. So blow up your balloons. You may begin. Pretty big, too. And then tie them off. All right, Sherry. Nope. Gabby, excuse me. Gabby, I'm going to ask you to come over here and stand on the stage. Come on, pray like you mean it. All right, okay, okay, not too big, not too big. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay, a little bit of air out of yours. Let's get them all about that size. Yeah. Yeah. A little bit bigger on yours, buddy. Just a little bit bigger, all right? And tie them, please, yes. All right. So do you guys believe that the prayers of your friends can hold you up? That they can actually make a difference for you? Do you think that they can actually bear your weight? So they're, they're going to need to bear your weight in this situation. You're going to want them to because what's going to happen is I'm going to ask you guys to lay those four balloons right down here on the ground. And we'll see if Gabby can stand on it and if the balloons will actually hold up her weight, if these prayers will actually hold up her weight. So let's put them down there on the ground. Uh, no, just on the ground, on the front, on the ground. Yeah, you can drop yours there. Thank you, thank you. Oh, and okay, she's doing her um, <laughs> Rojas imitation. Say that again. 
I'm a pastor. I can do anything. There you go. <laughs> All right. Well, she believes. So here we go. Can the prayers of some friends hold up the weight of another friend's rough situation? Okay. These are four balloons. All right. So, oh, boy. All right. <sighs> Disclaimer before that we do this one. <laughs> this should work. But the tray that you typically use for this is one of those um, cafeteria trays with the edges that are kind of soft. This one's metal, so I don't know if the edges will stick in, but they shouldn't, and they should support your weight. So, Gabby, are you a woman of faith? Yes. Okay. <laughs> Give me your hand. And take a step slowly. Slowly, slowly, slowly. Stand up. <laughs> oh, ye of little faith. She's standing on it. She's standing on it. She's upheld by the faith of her friends. Thank you very, very much, my friend. Give me a step off. Isn't that cool? <laughs> All right. We got a couple more here. All right. Oh, this one's really cool. All right. So this one is, is, is tricky as well. Back to life. How many of you have ever been in a situation where you are just out of faith? You feel like nothing is working in your spiritual life. Everybody experiences that, right? And you're just like, Lord, I just need you to do some sort of miracle. I need you to, to, to come and, and to just reignite. Well, in the situation where Lazarus was brought back to life, Jesus allowed him to die so that he could do the impossible, so that he could resurrect life in Lazarus. Well, I want to show you that it's actually possible to experience the resurrection experience today. Uh, this is a candle, and this is a lighter. And I'm going to ask somebody to kind of come up and help me. I need one more volunteer for this one. Hey, oh, boy, man, <laughs> the one person you want to play with fire, huh? <laughs> Little pyromaniac over here, <laughs> extremely excited. I was like, wow, okay. Okay, so I'm going to ask you to hold the candle, all right? What's your name? Say it again. Christian. Christian, all right. So, Christian, stand here so everybody can see. And we're going to see if we can do the impossible, right? So let's say that this is your faith, okay? And let's say that this is the faith of a friend, okay? So we're going to light the candle. Okay, your candle is lit. So now your faith is on fire. Literally. Isn't that awesome? Yeah, you're really happy. You're loving the Lord. You're praying every day. You're having your devotions. And then all of a sudden, you fail one of your exams. Boom. What happens? And then your face gets kind of blown on, right? And then all of a sudden, <laughs> no, don't blow it out just yet. <laughs> and then a temptation comes to you. And you're like, oh, man, that's getting hard to resist. And then your parents are mad at you. And then all of a sudden, like, you got dismissed from the basketball team. And then, <laughs> and then your teacher was mean at Sabbath school. Don't do that one, guys. Right? And then all this bad stuff starts happening. So your faith is being blown on, blown on, blown on. And then it eventually just goes, blows out, blow it out. But another friend says, come, wait, I want you to, I want you to believe. Continue believing, continue believing, continue believing. Wait. Oh, let's try that one more time. Okay, so what's going to happen is we're going to try to see if I could actually reignite that light. No, 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 no. Re Christian's a smart guy. Exactly. Christian's a smart guy. Okay, so let's try it one more time. All right, so you blow quick, and then I'm going to try to light it quick. Oh, wait. I'm not <laughs> I wasn't ready there, buddy. Uh, hold on a second. That's okay. One more time. Okay, here we go. All right. Wait. So when you blow... Blow as soft as you can to put it out, okay? Because the trick is, is that you want the smoke channels to go up, and then it's going to follow the smoke channels, okay? So let's try that one more time. All right, Christian. You got it? Mm -hmm. All right. Three, two, one, go. No, I just, I, yeah, I could, that was bad. Okay. <laughs> let's try one more time. One more time. <laughs> okay. Blow softer, though. Just blow a quick blow and not a sustained one. Just go. Okay, wait. Count down. Three, two, one, go. Okay. 
<laughs> okay, the fan. Okay, let's try one more time. Because I had to do this the first time I did it. One more time. If not, I can show you the video of what it looks like, okay? <laughs> okay. Okay, when you blow, blow like this. Okay? Okay. Look at me. Three. Two. One. Go. Ah! The smoke, it's because of the fans. Okay, so it's a little bit different in here. Sometimes you have those moments in life where faith reignition is hard. But, thank you, thank you. You can put it down. But just so that you don't get too disappointed, I can show you what it looks like here. Um, Because I actually did get it done the last time. Just so you can see what it looks like. Yeah, yeah, it's impressive when it works right, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So you're pretty much, you're lighting up the smoke. I've actually done it, but uh, just today wasn't wanting to work, but it's okay. Cool. So that one's a fun one. Um, okay. Then there's one more that I would like to do for you, and this one is kind of one that uh, I created myself. Um, because do you guys remember the story in Daniel chapter 5, what happened? The writing on the wall, right? And where is that board? It's supposed to be. Ah, there it is. Okay, yeah, thank you. All right. I need somebody who's really courageous to uh, hold up this board. Okay. <laughs> Christian, come here. All right. No, actually, I, I'm going to want you to see it. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask somebody else. Somebody else. Yeah? Okay. All right. So I'm going to ask you to go towards the wall. And when I say, I'm going to actually ask you to open this up and then turn around, have your back facing me, yeah, and then just hold it up, okay? So when you tell this story, let's say you're telling a story to children, you can just say, hey, guys, you know, there's this story where um, they're having this crazy party, and Daniel chapter 5, and all this wonderful stuff is happening, and in the, in, in they're partying, and they're ignoring God, and then all of a sudden, there's this amazing writing that takes place on the wall, right? And everybody's astounded, and, and, it, and it basically means something. But not everybody knew what it meant, right? So have you ever wondered what that looked like? Have you? Well, let's see if we can try to illustrate it here. So, Daniel would have had to try to interpret that, right? The saying is the writing on the wall. So, you ask the kids, what does the writing on the wall mean? Right? What does the writing on the wall mean, guys? It means, turn it upside down, the end. And so, this is the end of your illustrations for today. <laughs> That's, that's actually, um, what that is, is glow-in-the-dark tape. And if you put glow-in-the-dark tape and uh, get it charged with a uh, laser, with particularly the blue laser that reacts with it, and it, it'll hold the charge, and it'll stay glowing for about five to ten minutes. So that's a really cool one for kids. If you do that in the sanctuary, instead of, what's that? <laughs> blue laser. Yeah, it'll work with red, but not as well. Um, so uh, in terms of resources... Uh, the main resources I used was um, Tina Hauser's books. She's got a bunch of these illustrations in there, Beaker's Bubbles in the Bible. 
tinahauser.net. You can see some of those illustrations there. tinahauser.net. Um, after that, there's YouTube. YouTube is super duper useful. There's loads of amazing ideas on YouTube. You could just look for illustrations, look for science projects. And then the creative part comes when you just ask God, say, Lord, how does this apply to your word? And, you know, ask him to show you how you can apply some of these amazing illustrations to the word of God. Um, so there's that. And then the final one is just you and the Holy Spirit. Um, this one is not one that I've, I've seen anybody else do. I just literally came up with that idea. And it just worked out perfectly um, for, for using. So uh, has that been useful? Do you guys have any questions before we go? <laughs> That's a good question. Uh, it, took, it took like a good like 20 minutes or so to get it right. But yeah, yeah, you have to do it so that the kids are like, oh, OK, because you don't want them to get it right away. But um, any other questions? <laughs> no? If not, let's say a closing prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you so much for your goodness, your grace. We thank you for um, the power of creativity, Father. Lord, the word of God says in the beginning you created. That was the very first thing you did. And so I believe in the last days you want us as your people to be creative, Father. Help us to use that power of creativity which is sparked by love to illustrate lessons of who you are and the life that we need to live for these children so that they can live for you and be ready for you when you come, Lord. Inspire everybody here with the thought and understanding that you are their guide. You will show them what illustrations are best to use in their churches so that they'll have success with those kids, Lord. Give them abundant success because we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. God loves you. So do I.